My name is Thaddeus Hogarth, and this is Coffee Talk. Hey, Thaddeus. How are you? Ron, pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> That's great. Out here in remote land. Hey, everybody. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department, and we are here today for another episode of Coffee Talk, and our special guest today is Thaddeus Hogarth, who just said hello to you. Uh, we've also got Cheryl Bailey, assistant chair of the guitar department. Hi, everybody. And Ian Steed, our senior department coordinator. Hey, Ian. Hello. And, uh, you know, three of us today have our guitar department coffee mug. And Cheers, everybody. I'm the odd one out, but I do have coffee in here. Yeah, and there's a guitar on there too. There is a guitar on here and my sister sent it to me. So Sally, thank you if you check out our podcast. I love what that. And it's, cool. yeah. And it's a guitar on there. It says, have a smashing day. There's some it, pinatas. Yeah, it's a so. pinata and a cactus, you know. I like that. It's festive. Yeah, <laughs> it is festive. I mean, we're in a good mood because we have Thaddeus here. Um, and Thaddeus, you've been in, a member of the guitar department in different ways for a long time, number of years. Uh, yeah, it's something like 20 years, you know. But uh, I was also a student back here in, in 19, you know, back <laughs> in 19, uh, in the 80s, so 80 to 84 to 88, you know, mm. and uh, it was a beautiful thing. So first of all, does that mean that you and Cheryl overlapped as students? Oh, Cheryl and I, we used to jam, right? We were in an ensemble with Ron Mathy. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. That was a long didn't, time ago. Didn't you play a red 335? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Good memory. memory. Wow. wow. And Ron, of course, is still on the faculty of the ensemble department. Was he your yeah. teacher then, or was he also a student at that time? Uh, he, uh, Ron, uh, Ron McD was, yeah. was, was, uh, I think it was an ensemble. It was just sort of a, uh, like a general, like sort of jazz ensemble. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he was, he was the faculty member at the time. I just remember that, you know? Oh, that's so cool. That's great. So, you know, when, when everyone talks about your friends in college become your colleagues, well, here's proof, right? if both of you were together at Berkeley in the same ensemble, isn't that cool? Yeah. That's hilarious, yeah. actually. Cheryl was a burning player back then, no, too. No, that's oh, not true. Yeah. Not true. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure she remembers you that way, and you probably don't remember oh, yourself I, that way. No, I, I, rem I have vague memories of, of Ron making us memorize uh, the the melody to Charlie Parker, the heads to Charlie Parker tunes, and yeah, it was Dexterity. a new experience for me. You, you know, know he, he did a great thing one time, I'll never forget this, but he made each one of us comp for the other person, but the other rest of the band would lay out. And I'll never forget that because it made me realize that, oh, if you have a band, it's a quartet or a quintet or whatever, it can be a series of duos or trios. It doesn't every, you know, somehow you think we're all going to play. So we're all playing right. together at once or something. It was really brilliant. Yeah, that, that was one of the best things I learned from that class. Yeah, it was it was a it was a great experience. I think that uh, for me, just getting getting the experience of, I mean, I was I was actually believe it or not, I was an older student back then, and and I'd been playing for in bands and stuff for a long time. I considered myself a professional musician, but whoa, was it a wake up call when I got in there and I had to play Charlie Parker tunes? It was it was like, a, you know, just I mean, it was definitely a beautiful thing. It was just great i mean i learned a lot i learned so much it was just like whoa wait a minute there's this type of soloing where you can actually hear the chords in the in the solo you know like making through the changes and all that stuff it was it was great i learned so much so but that's really cool i mean what i want to know listening to you is you both remember each other from that time and then you met again over the years or at berkeley are there things about the other person's playing that you recognize then, like even as a student, you thought, oh yeah, here's what, it, here's my impression of the other one, this person's playing. And then when you meet again, when you hear them again as an older professional, are you surprised? Is it different? 
are there things well, that remain the same that you felt like you heard from back then? Um, I don't know, Cheryl. I mean, I remember thinking that you were like sort of a bebop uh, wizard back then. And when I heard you again, I was like, I don't believe she actually got better, you know, because that's because you were crazy then. You know, and you're you know? crazy now. You know? That stays the same. I was like, <laughs> I was like, wow. Wow, truth from the guitar faculty. Check this out. Yeah. You're crazy. It's like humility sometimes uh, alters perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, Cheryl, what about you? Like, did something stick with you that you recognized later when you heard Thaddeus as as an older professional? Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely the being melodic and and just really connecting with all the notes and and having meaning like searching for meaning in everything that you do thanks yeah no i mean i think i think these things are all true and you know we're kind of all coming to berkeley as sort of diamonds in the rough <laughs> and yeah. there's that element there's something under there that we're working on polishing and getting stronger and and that's the thing it keeps developing so so that element in you that strength of your connecting with melody connecting with time um, and groove and, and yeah, just the melodicism and stuff and, and just, yeah, really feeling that it's coming from you, that you, you weren't phoning it in, right. you know? You know, it's interesting that we're having this conversation now because uh, a couple of days ago we taped a webinar, which was like a larger interview like this with other alums who preceded both of you. Mike Stern and Lainey Stern and Wayne Krantz. And um, Lainey called me this morning. She said she was thinking about it. And she said, you know, I was thinking about in the conversation that as your skills develop on the guitar, so do your standards. And so you never feel like you've ever attained. If you're doing it right, you just never feel like you've ever attained. You always feel like a diamond in the rough, basically like Cheryl said, right? And I think that's coming across here. I think that's really good for students to hear, because I think sometimes there's an impression that, oh, I'm coming to Berkeley, and then in four years, I'm gonna be where I wanna be. But I'm not sure that anyone ever feels that way. Was that true for you, Thaddeus? Do you feel like you're still learning? Oh my goodness, yeah. Well, I think, I don't know. I think of the journey of, as, of uh, the sort of musical journey as um, maybe an analogy or a, you know, a way to think of it is like you're climbing up a hill and as you climb up the view is obscured but the further up you go the less obscured the view is and but you see how much further you have to go <laughs> and so sometimes you just look back to see well at least i've come a long way even though i have further and then you go up further and you you learn more and you realize that you don't really know any you know you the more you learn the more you realize that you there is to learn and so um so the journey for me, I don't even remember the question now, I'm completely spaced out, but you get my, you get my, my point. You know, it's almost like the more you learn, the more humility you have to have, you know? At yeah, I, I, my perspective. I'm pretty sure you answered the question if I remember what I asked, I'm pretty sure. But <laughs> <laughs> um, what did it have, feel like? Do I have coffee in this? Yeah, I, yeah keep, you take know. another swig of whatever. <laughs> um, what, what what did it feel like on your first day at Berkeley? Do you remember what happened? Oh my goodness! No, it was overwhelming. It was, it was a uh, well at the time. It felt like it was mainly a jazz school, and I, I I had been like sort of a professional musician for seven years, and I I was done with that. I needed to go back and really learn about music because I mean I love playing music, but I love music enough to want to learn more about it. And so, you know, when I showed up here, I was, I was like this sponge. I just wanted to learn. And it was, it was a, it was a beautiful, but intimidating and overwhelming experience. You know, like my first day, it was like, you're doing auditions. I'll never forget my audition with John Damien, you know, but it was like, it was, I think it lasted all of like 30 seconds, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and then he's like, okay, that's good. I was like, that's it. You don't want to hear me play my special this or my special that. No, we're all set, you know. So it was it was definitely a wake up call to uh, to how much there was to to learn, you know, versus how much you needed to know to function as a musician. 
in the world in a band, you know, goodness, you can just learn 10 different chords or shapes and then you're a working musician on your way to a Grammy award. And then, um, and then, but my goodness, that's just so much, you know, that so much more that you, you can learn. And, and, um, and my first day at Berkeley really just sort of like hammered that home, you know, it was like, oh my goodness, I mm. really, I might've been a good player back in wherever I used to play, but you know, now, now I really got to get down to some serious work. So, um, I have nothing but great, you know, uh, uh, whatever memories of those first times as intimidating and as nervous as you were. Um, uh, but it was definitely sort of, a, I don't know, the, everyone was so good, you know, <laughs> there were just so many great players, the faculty just, uh, just blew me away. I was like, their brains, you'd ask them a question, you know, and it was like, boom just like this wellspring of musical knowledge. And it was a very exciting time. Also for me as a musician, I had played a lot. And I grew up in a, in a pretty sort of small uh, musical environment. I grew up in a small island. I was born in England, but I grew up in a small island called St. Kitts. And so I played a lot of American Top 40. I played a lot of in hotel bands. Um, and then when I came to the U.S., I was playing in funk bands, bands, cover bands, you know, that kind of stuff. I grew up playing a lot of reggae, R&B, funk, disco. Yes, I was playing a lot of those <laughs> disco songs when they were on the charts, you know. And um, and then uh, so my experience at Berkeley was was is almost like uh, say this without losing my train of thought. Um, it was almost like context anytime i would be like in a class or with an instructor and then he would say well you know it's like this sharp four minor seven flat five thing and i'm like what you know what was that and he's like like in days of wine and roses and i was like aha i know that because it's like when you're gonna end the tune but you take another lap around the block you know i was sort of you know figuring it out in these other ways that i could relate to from playing the songs in in bands and stuff like that so the experience for me was just like, oh my goodness, that's just like this song and that's just like that song. And that pretty much started happening the very first day, you know, I started at Berkeley. I was like, this is so cool. Like I just got this new thing. And I used to play this Earth, Wind and Fire tune that had this new little two five thing in it. So um, it was just, it was mind blowing. It was, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. I, I, I don't know what it's like today for a student to come on board, but, but certainly back then, um, I'm sure it's just probably even more overwhelming. Technology was not a big thing. It was a big thing, but it wasn't. You know, I used to go to the ear training lab and uh, I would sign out a reel to reel tape with my intervals and all that stuff. And then a cassette with my, okay, non diatonic intervals. You know, you give them your, your ID and then you plug in your little cassette and you put on these big headphones that you know, with, with uh, you know, cups this size, you know, and you're like, okay, you know, and you back and forth. But now, I mean, you know, you have laptop, you have a powerful recording studios right in front of you, you know, you can do full productions. So, um, so I've seen a lot of change. Uh, it's all great. And to me, as long as you're making great music, that's all that matters with it, you know? Yeah. Um, my, my one follow-up question to that is you also had a first day as a faculty member and when you came back and started teaching at Berkeley, did you notice some differences in the environment that things that were different or things that had stayed the same from the time you were a student? What was that first day like? Um, first day at faculty. Well, again, you know, uh, you know, I was just sort of blown away that, uh, well, first of all, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of uh, people that taught me were, were still here. And I was like, I remember sitting in a, in a department meeting room and, you know, Larry announced, well, you know, we got a new faculty member, Thaddeus Hogarth. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, um, you know, uh, so it was just the idea that I was, you know, a, a part of the team was just, I, I think I pinched myself for the first, you know, semester or two, you know, but, um, but uh, similar kind of thing, you know, just just being in awe of the, the greatest minds in music being in the same room with me, you know, it was a little different from being a student, because, 
for me, I was a little wide eyed as a student, just like looking and soaking up as, as faculty, it was a similar thing, but, but it was more like, you know, within my colleagues and it was great that I could just knock on someone's door and say, Hey, you know, what is this thing we're supposed to be, you know, handling? Oh, okay, cool. Great. Yeah. How do you handle it? What do you think of when we're doing this? What's your approach to this? You know? And, um, uh, yeah, it was just, I got, it's just, you know, it's so funny because I, I think of my life in a few different stages and, and certainly one of them is, is before Berkeley as a student, then after Berkeley as a student, and then before Berkeley as, before getting hired as faculty and after, and, and both of the afters were, were, were much better than the befores, you know, uh, so, um, so yeah, it's great. I mean, I feel, I still feel honored, you know, when, mm -hmm when when i talk to someone and they they uh, uh for some reason they they're uh i still sometimes can't believe it you know what yeah. I mean? i'm like i just play this i play this play this guitar and i mean i play a bunch of different instruments too but but certainly the guitar is my first love you know i do i do I don't you know that's the question i'm rambling a bit Somehow no it's great the zoom thing makes me think well am i saying the right thing <laughs> how do i look you yeah, know. you know, great. it's so cool to hear all of this coming from you because like, I actually, I remember my first day at Berkeley was you were the first person I met actually. Really? I probably don't remember this. Yeah, I walked in 921 and I was like terrified. I was shaking. I was like, what the heck am I doing here? I'm going to go do this ratings audition. Like, and uh, I took an elevator with you up and you were just like super cool. And you just like introduced yourself and you were like, yeah, you know, it's cool, man. You'll wow. be fine. And I was just like, holy crap. Here's this like, you know, guitar Jedi master at oh, like this, you know, wow. place that I'm like, so, and it was just like, yeah. And he's just like a totally cool down to earth normal. Wow. He kind of like talked me down from my ratings audition. So yeah. Wow, I'm glad. So cool to hear you. I must've like, been having a good day. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, isn't that the truth? I, I'm very conscious of that every time, especially when we're starting a semester, that people come in and like, this is their dream. And, and what I started saying when, you know, in all honesty is like, well, honestly, it's our dream too, right? All the faculty and all the chairs, like we are as excited, like we're getting, you know, we've come to the point where we have a comfort level with it, that here we are. Um, but it's our department together. And I think um, all three of those stories just show that, that you've always believed that, Thaddeus. And I think that is a reflection of, of why our guitar department is so strong. Um, and Cheryl, I'm thinking like, I'm watching your reactions to some of these things. And I know that you have a lot of parallel experience here. Um, and I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are at this point. Like, what are you thinking about? Well, I think this is great, Thaddeus, for you to share this because because we all have that first day at Berkeley, either, and 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 we like that's really amazing that Ian ran into you that day and has that memory, and and we have this connection from when we were kids at Berkeley. So I, I think this is the best part of this podcast or having these discussions is, you know, for for everybody to to go. Oh, I, I think. You, when you think back of yourself, you know yourself on those that first day, and and then to realize, wow, your teacher had that same thing, you know, like okay, I'm gonna be okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be okay, all right, all right. So I'm I'm yeah. really glad you shared all that with us. Yeah, I find it it's really just amazing. I'm I am um, I'm often blown away anytime I have some students say that reach out to me from their various professional careers like I remember once having a student who came back from LA and he was like oh I wanted to meet and hang with you and he sat down <clears throat> and um and he was telling me how you know I'll never forget what you told me and I'm like well, well wait a minute what did I say you know I hope I was having a good day and he's like I blah 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 and it's something really positive and I'm like really wow and as faculty you know sometimes we we don't realize how many how many of those moments that are sort of like really because I can remember a few myself as a student where mm -hmm. somebody did a similar thing Ian to what you said and I'm just I still remember certain 
key things and when i mentioned them people were like really you know my inter uh, my audition with john damien you know people i'm like that you know like and it was just this really significant moment and sometimes i have students come back and say yeah i still use that i'm like really you do i'm like yeah man i'll never forget what you told me i'm like what did i say you know and then they'll say and i'm like yeah cool and it just blows me away you know how much and it's an honor to be able to say that i in some way contributed to this person's development and they're out there in hollywood making soundtracks for different you know movies or documentaries or something like that so yeah when i heard that i was like wow whoa wait what a minute you know it's one of those moments that just makes you feel like you're in the right place doing the right thing you know and we need those moments <laughs> definitely yeah you know? yeah and i think we always need those moments i mean that's what strikes me when we're all talking that if you're that type of person that's always learning that is what makes you a great musician. It makes you a great teacher. And our department is full of that. Like everyone on the faculty is like that. And so we all continuously have those moments. I remember meeting Ian, I was teaching a class. I was like in my first semester, I was team teaching it with Abby Aronson. And I was thinking like, I hope these students believe me, you know? <laughs> I hope they believe me. You know, I I, uh, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is going to help them. I remember meeting you, Thaddeus. I remember meeting Cheryl. I remember meeting Cheryl when I was really young at National Guitar Workshop, and Cheryl was the guest, you know, and do you remember that? I remember that. Well, Kim, to tell you about that, I remember when I would be preparing, Tom Dempsey, our friend, our colleague, would invite me to do these workshops, and I would be terrified that everyone would know I was a fraud, a charlatan by the first class. And I, I couldn't put together my curriculum until the night before. Like all week I would blow it off. And I, cause all week I'd be thinking, I'm gonna show up at guitar workshop and they're gonna know the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> and then somehow Sunday night, poof, inspiration would hit me and I'd write the whole course for the week. So that's what I was going through when you met me. <laughs> I mean, I think to me, that's a good sign, right? That we all are humble enough to keep working and like honest enough to just do it anyway and share what we do. So um, Ian, this feels like a good time for you to ask the question that I love that you always ask. Yeah, so uh, with everybody on this show, uh, I ask a question um, about, you know, where you've come from where you are and sort of the wisdom that you've gained and how that imparts to the students. So like for a student who's there who might not have the wherewithal to think of this thing, like what is something that they should be asking that they don't necessarily know to ask yet? Wow, how have people been answering this question? <laughs> <laughs> we can't tell you. We don't. We we honestly don't remember. We're so tired from teaching and practicing. But we just oh. tell us what you think. What that they don't know to ask? You talking specifically about music, or just in general about music in your life? Or, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think maybe. Uh, context you know like uh, like for me context has always been important and so even if even if they might not ask I might offer you know the idea that well here's why we're going through this scale or this mode or this whatever this concept <clears throat> but here's how you'd use it next week you know on the gig so just I guess basically just you know why am I practicing this, you know, like, and, uh, and, uh, but maybe some students do know uh, to ask that. And certainly it's one of the things I deliver, you know, like I have this little expression on shortest distance to the paycheck, you know, like, yeah, here you go. Just now don't think of that. Forget about that. Just think of it as playing up two frets. That's it. Boom. You know, so, um, and that's because, you know, it's almost like the study of music, music for me has been the organization of information and how quickly I can get that information. If, I, if I'm a writer, if I'm writing song, then I don't need to be that good at it. I can just figure it out. If I'm a player, then I need to be able to pull that from where in my brain right away. And how can I get that? What's the quickest way for me to incorporate whatever this sound is or this idea in the case of an improv thing? How can I 
integrate this into my playing, well, I could sit there and write it out and analyze it and do a whole chart, a flow chart on the wall and study and memorize it. Or I can just think of it as this simple thing. And, and oftentimes I'll make students write their own notes because then that way they end up memorizing it. Because, you know, when if you give them a handout, then, you know, it's a nice thing to put on the table on the corner and they'll just forget about it. But if you make them write it down, you know, like that's how you that's the learning process. So um, so again, along with an answer to your question, but I, I just think like maybe context, you know, like um, how can I integrate this thing, whatever this thing is we're doing? It could be just a groove thing. Like, you know, oftentimes in R&B lab, I teach people how to play together, you know, and we just start off and like play. No, you got to play something, hey, you know, just G minor, just play. Now, why are you playing that? He's playing that, you know, like, you know, teaching people how to groove. So the idea, context, you know, just to uh, like, why am I doing this thing and how can I use it in the world of my musical identity? I hope I answered that question. I have, I feel like I'm rambling a lot. Here. No, that's like, great. That's, yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great um, question to ask context. Yeah, I think yeah. that's, that. Uh, the more I teach, I, I also think that applies to teaching people how to practice and what to practice or why to practice those things. Because if you're here, you're seeking something, you're see you feel that there's a potential you have to reach and we're here to guide them. So the more that they know, you know, about the process, but I think people are afraid to ask, like they, so I think that's a great question to be able to ask whatever you're working on with your teacher, how, how and why and where and when do I do this? Those are really important questions. Also, I think it, it, it lends itself to, um, I don't know, inspiration. Like if you can figure out that, you know, if you, your eyes on the prize, if the idea is that I can use this next week or next month or whenever I start playing or whenever I write or compose, if I can use it, then it gives you whatever the velocity is to the excitement velocity. Let's, that's a new term. <laughs> I just made it up. Um, it gives you the excitement velocity to like, whoa, get up to cruising altitude where you like, I'm excited about practicing this thing because guess what? Next week when I'm, I perform my song and, and, um, those are the things that you know that as a student i was i was really interested in even though i was interested in the big picture let's call it physics analysis of it all i was like constantly saying well how can i integrate this and as into my musical identity and as an older musician uh, older student i had that because i'm like i had the reverse of that because i was like oh that's just like this other thing the context is just like the shop full minus seven thing is just like my days of wine and roses it's like reverse engineering kind of thing but uh, it just gets you excited you know like if we could all play like george benson if we practice this thing i guess we would all be just like every day we two weeks you know if you can see i don't know eyes on the prize and so it keeps you excited about practicing so thaddeus what does your practicing look like now like what kind of stuff do you focus on? How do you? It's really interesting. Um, I I think that I think that for me, um, I've gotten better at at uh, at knowing how Thaddeus learns, you know, and I'm also sort of a visual artist too. So for me, the visual aspect of of the instrument is good because I play a bunch of different instruments. Maybe not as well as I play guitar, but I, I've been playing a lot of piano lately, and it's it it functions. Uh, it messes around. Uh, opens up and messes with a different part of my brain and I'm sort of amazed that um, that my musical brains can be so separate you know and so but I found sort of little links between like my chromatic harmonica play and my piano play I'm like well I can't think of it like this and it's almost like te thinking in a different language I don't, I don't really speak fluently different languages but from people I've talked to who speak different languages, they're like, yeah, oh, I think in French now. And I'm like, really? <laughs> wow. You know, and then I find myself thinking a lot in terms of piano, but I've also found the little duct that I can get that it'll leach into guitar. So it doesn't really matter what instrument I'm practicing at this point. I find that some of the lines and ideas and musical things that I, that I practice on one instrument uh, can translate into the other instrument, but 
I have learned that it wasn't like that in because I remember when I first in the 90s I was playing guitar put the guitar down for a couple of years I practiced nothing but chromatic harmonica and I'm like this is great because now I can talk mm -hmm. like horn players B flat it's not just the note it's my best friend there are many things I have to do to create a B flat and you know it's all going to translate into my guitar playing and it didn't you know I felt mm. like when I was playing guitar I had one brain when I was playing harmonica I had another brain and uh, I was like how do I make it work and so um so I think of my life as constant practice I'm either playing writing composing you know recording and um and then I take a break to do things like eat and socialize and have a life you know so most of the time I practice you know, sort of constantly. And, and so, and it doesn't really matter which instrument it is because I think of music as this big holistic thing, you know, like what I'm thinking, most of the music happens in my head. And then I've learned on trying to, f I've learned how to find ways to make it happen quicker, you know, through my hands, you know? Um, so in terms of actual practical definition, I pick my instrument up you know, every day and I work on something, but most of it's ear stuff, you know, like I do a lot of sort of performance ear training things, call and response. And I, and so my practicing looks completely different from my performing. You know, I practice certain things and certain things are very sort of like consistently little, uh, you know, approach things, you know, that I try to hear. And then when I go on a gig, I play them. So, but that happens on each instrument. It's the same. It's the same for me. Um, um, and lately, I've been on a well. I was on sabbatical in the spring, and so I did a lot of recording on my sabbatical, a lot. And um, the recording process for me is also I consider it practice too, because because um, you learn <laughs> you learn what yeah. sounds good, and you learn how well you can do a single take. And sometimes I find myself okay. I like that solo. It started good, but I'm gonna stop it right there and continue it here. And so it's almost like you learn the craft of composing an interesting solo. Cheryl, to speak to the melodicism, like that's always been important to me, the graph of a solo. You know, it's not about, it's never about chops for me because it's all about creating a piece of music that you can sit in a class and analyze and say, listen to the, this motif right here and look how it repeats and like how it goes up. And so, um, so I find myself digging into this recording process that I've been doing lately and, um, and like writing things and composing things and really sort of breaking them down as to why that sounded good. So the recording process is part of my, a big part of my practice now. So I've been recording a lot lately. I'm surprised that my, my level of, uh, of being prolific is just almost as much as it was when I was on my sabbatical. And so, uh, um, uh, so it's everything from picking up different instruments, spending a good deal of time on this one mm -hmm. and recording a lot and listening a lot, still constantly music in my in my house. You know, it's wired for sound the entire house. I can record up here. I can record in the living area downstairs. The first floor as a recording studio. It's all purple down there, you know. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's great. Um, one thing that you mentioned that struck me was you're talking about you your visual art that you do and and that seems to be a theme in our guitar department i have a visual art really? background abby aronson mick goodrick mm -hmm. david tronzo uh, and i didn't know this about you that we had already kind of fantasized about having like a guitar department art group you know faculty art group which i think could be really cool um what what role does that play, do you think, in your creative, holistic approach? To um, I think of myself as, a, as an artist that, that happened to be the most developed in the musical area, you know. Mm -hmm. But I used to, I grew up drawing. I used to draw a lot, you know, usually pencil or charcoal. And mm -hmm. um, it has to do with the way I organize information in my brain, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like, the the like the guitar is it's a very visual instrument you know and it's like i feel like we're trying to create logic where it doesn't necessarily exist but we we pin on you know well this shape doesn't because you, you can go this way it's logical it goes up we go this way why is it going up oh because we're going across you know there there are things like that and so there's a spatial thing that happens with me and one of the reasons why i think 
I've improved so much as, as for example, as a piano player is because piano is much more logical, you know, than, than our instrument, than our, than our favorite instrument. But so I think it, it plays, but at the same time, I've learned to organize the information on guitar in ways that, that are almost like spatial, you know, like I think in terms of relative, you know, on other instruments, I think more in terms of the note being that's where the note is. That's a B flat. That's where it occurs on guitar. I think in terms of much more in terms of relationships, you know, this is a note and that's another note. And this is the relationship between those notes, mm -hmm. you know, versus, you know, that's a B flat and that's an E flat. And that's mm -hmm. a relationship, you know, for me on guitar, because of the nature of the, the way the fretboard is laid out, I think more in terms of the relationship between the spatial and sonic pitch of a note and the other notes that I play, you know, and that goes for everything, whether it's improv. So I think it has more to do with the way that just I organize information and it's appealing to a lot of students, I think, that are artists too. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's the same for any of you, you know, is that, is that, do you find that the case, uh, Kim? Yeah, I think that is really well put. That's so interesting. I, I think I've always felt that about relationships and in art and in the on the instrument, but I've never heard someone really put it that way that you did. That's absolutely true because I've thought of visual art like that. And this is something that Mick Goodrick and I used to talk about all the time. You know, like if you try to draw a horse, for example, he loved the horse for whatever reason, yeah, right? The upside right? Down. You try to yeah. draw a horse and you can't do it. But if you flip it upside down and you just think about the relationships of the lines that you're making, you will draw a really great representational horse because you're taking the judgment out of it and you're right. just seeing relationships. And the same is true, I feel like, on the guitar because as a classical guitarist, we're always thinking tonally, where are you going to put something? You know, are you going to use the A on the fourth string? Are you going to use the A on the third string? Or, you know, are you going to use a harmonic instead? And it's all timbral and it's all like, what other notes do you have to play with those? And I think you're right. I think that's the same idea of trying to just see how does this relate to what else I want to do? Right. And so therefore, where does it go and how does it sound because of that? Or in art, you know, how does it express itself because of that? That makes a ton of sense to me. Right. Yeah. Hey, Thaddeus, do you do... Um mostly drawing or painting or everything sculpting what what's well, your what's your main uh, thing that you love to do well um it's mostly um mostly drawing and uh, and um it's not like i would be ready to i'm a little shy about my art i would be, i would even though i've done a lot of it i i don't know if i'd be ready to like submit it to the guitar department art thing i'd wait i'd wait to see the quality of the of the you know the overall submissions before i was like okay yeah we can put mine in there sure yeah you know but but um but uh yeah mostly sort of like drawing a pencil i did a lot of pencil um not so great with colors you know like uh watercolors or oil paints or any oil or anything like that but, you know, sort of lately experimenting with some things that were like, uh, you know, like I have, I also collect, um, sort of collect art. I, I don't know if you know, Miles Davis was was this amazing artist. And so mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw his his uh, his work and, and I was hanging with some friends in New York. We went to a gallery on Upper West Side and they were selling the artwork. It was a place called, oh, Bag One, you know. It was close to that place, Smoke the way everybody plays in New York and they were selling the artwork of Miles Davis and and um, and John Lennon, you know, and it was limited edition prints. And so so I have I have a few of of his uh, limited edition lithos and um, and I was I'm really sort of inspired by that, that kind of um, uh, I don't know, I guess it was kind of abstract. So I'm sort of experimenting with that kind of stuff, you know, I would say. But, um, but, you know, mainly just, you know, sort of some pencil stuff, some, uh, I've been getting more into some, I don't know, I like Basquiat, so I'm experimenting with some things like that and have words in them too, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, I have, a, my dining table is a library conference 
big library conference leather top desk and it has these big drawers and so that's where my artwork is hidden you know mm. and only only people i'm like okay well i can trust this person you want to see some art and I'll pull out the thing <laughs> okay good now this is really look at all this stuff so um i don't necessarily share it that much with people mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely a big part of my identity it's the way i organize stuff in my brain i said between the visual and the ears you know that's the strongest thing for me i still think of myself as a a musician that plays by ear even though yes i do have the you know knowledge to be able to sit down and analyze it but most of the time when someone says what would you do over this i'd like play it for me and i'll tell you and then i almost have to deconstruct it because i'm like well let me see what did i just do okay i did this this works you know mm -hmm. you know what about that i don't know this works this works play this it sounds good why does it work well the sound good you know my sister's always asking me what would I play over this chord? Because she plays piano. And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you just play something that sounds good? And then mm. if it doesn't, then don't play that note, you know? And then you can figure out why the other notes work, if you want to. But, you know, so, um, yeah. I mean, that's that's it. Visual, auditory, play by ear, you know? Mm -hmm. Raw, listen, play by ear. I like that. I mean, I like that there's like a theme that, kind of emerges when I'm listening to you that that I pick up on that you've had a whole life in music that where you're able to adapt and self-reflect and try things and change things and I think that that's really important right now for younger musicians who are listening because this we're recording this like during the time of the pandemic and for a lot of people this is the first huge time when they've had to adapt to something really beyond their control. And I think what is coming through is that there are always times in your life as a musician and as an artist where you have to learn to adapt and really examine things. Do you have any specific advice to sum that up for someone who's going through this for the first time and isn't sure how to handle it? you mean just the the idea of ad adapting or yeah i mean i think that's kind of the theme right i mean i think like a lot of our students have thought like okay berkeley's my dream and i think i have an idea of what that's going to be and i'm coming to study and then all of a sudden the world is turned upside down for them with that and so you know as someone who's adapted over the years yeah. What would you say to students who are probably going to come to you, you know, in a week or two and say, like, what do I do in the spring? Because this isn't kind of what I envisioned. Right. I mean, I think that at least my experience was that Berkeley is about adapting. You know, if anything, this environment teaches you to do just that. Um, I mean, when I came here, I was like, I just want to play guitar I'm going to be a performance major and then after a couple of semesters and I was like oh my goodness but I want to learn about that and I want to learn about this and I want to learn about that and then and then at the end of it you end up switching your major I, I did professional music because I wanted to learn so many different things that I thought I didn't want to learn when I got here you know I was like I'm not interested in that this is my thing I'm, this is what I want to do and then all of a sudden once I get here I'm like okay well well, that would be a disservice to knowledge if I didn't go over there and take a little bit of that course and learn a little bit of that. And my goodness, I like doing live sound. I want to do like, I want to learn something about engineering, you know? And so the idea is just that it's the place where you come to figure out how to adapt. And, you know, it's a good, you know, I often get the, this, this uh, question from students where it's like, man, I don't know how to manage time. And I'm like, or, you know, any ideas of how to to manage my time because I have this and I have that. And I was like, this is the perfect place to learn how to manage your time, because guess what you're going to have to do when you get out, when you get out and you're in the real world, you better have that day timer or whatever schedule or you better know how to use that calendar because, you know, you're going to have a million different projects if you if you're if you're open to doing stuff the pie chart of the musical identity, a little bit of teaching, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, then you gotta have you know, time management. So you learn a lot of things like adapting, like managing your time, you learn a lot. And that's what this place is all about. So don't freak out, 
you know, that's why you're here. You know, you came, you wanted to be, I mean, you might even change your major and, and your instrument. You Like you want to, I mean, I know I've had some students that were like, yeah, you know, I'm changing my, my instrument. What do you do? I'm a guitar, I'm a vocalist, but I'm switching to guitar because mm -hmm. I play guitar. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. Good call, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Come on over, right? Yeah. Yeah, come on over. We can we we can use you over here, but you know, but they wouldn't know that if they came here, you know. And so, don't freak out because you feel like your world's upside down. Check it out. Everybody went through that, and I've told many people about my performance major switch. And I was studying with Mark French and Jim Kelly at the time, and then I think it was in my sixth semester. I was like, you know, I'm gonna, fifth semester, no, sixth semester. I think it was. I was like, I'm switching. I'm doing all this stuff, and you do all this stuff to to make up and um i was so um intent on being a performer that i didn't even want to do academics you know mm -hmm. so when i came my first five semesters i didn't do any academics and all of a sudden i'm like wait a minute i'm gonna graduate with a diploma and mm -hmm. other people graduating degree so i doubled up on academics i tested out of out of english because i grew up in the british territory you know <laughs> And, uh, and so I just did, a, and we, we did a lot of writing. And so mm -hmm. I tested out of like, a, I think a year or at least a semester or two of, of English. And then all of a sudden I doubled up on some academics. And then so I graduated with the, the degree, but I didn't have that intention initially. I was just like, okay, must play. I'm gonna be this and that. And then all of a sudden the whirlpool of Berkeley comes along and I'm like, wait a minute. I think I'm like, whoa, I, you know, this, this instrument and that instrument, I think I want to do a year of piano. I'm going to do basic piano. I want to do that, you know? And, and um, so you do freak out for a minute. And then after you realize that that is normal and it's probably desirable, then, then that's what you, you go with it. So basically don't freak out. Just, you know, that's why you're here. It's a process of learning and changing and growing and deciding. And you could come as a performer and wind up as a film award women award winning film scorer somewhere you know uh, mm -hmm. but it's a beautiful thing it's all good it's all good mm -hmm. so the, i guess the answer to that don't panic it's all good <laughs> that's good that's the uh yeah i mean that makes me feel better as well i think we all have to tell ourselves that these days especially mm -hmm. um cheryl um there's a lot of, I think, parallels. I saw you raise your hand a couple times when Thaddeus was talking about pro music and things like, do you have a final question that comes to mind for you? I, no, I don't, I don't really have any que questions per se. I, I just really enjoyed Thaddeus, you sharing all your thoughts about, um, you know, the anxiety of day one <laughs> and, and how we can all relate to that. And I really enjoyed hearing you talk about your, your visual art and how that relates to music and, and also the things that you talked about um, with you playing other instruments and, and how that integrates into your whole being as a musician. So for me, this was just a lovely conversation and, and opportunity to get some time to hang out with you and, and dig in a little deeper into the, the brain of Thaddeus Hogarth. So oh thanks for sharing all that. I think- It's a scary place. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a beautiful place. And um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed so many things. I mean, I'm gonna go back and listen to this all later and I'm sure I'm gonna pick up a lot more. You, thank you for sharing um, really a lot of wise, deep stuff with us today. Yeah. I well, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I was thinking about one thing that I thought about, and maybe this is a good uh, summary, is that I remember when I got out and I'm a student, I'm out there and I'm making records and I'm hustling and I'm booking my own gigs and I'm learning, hiring a publicist, hiring a promotion company and literally having my own, my own little recording label and all that stuff. And I'm driving all over the country and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I'm doing it. And then I'll never forget my interview with Larry and Rick when when they first because we had been sort of talking about something like five years we had been discussing the idea of me coming and doing things at Berkeley and then I remember having this sitting down and having this discussion with Larry and Rick when we finally got to to having a an a, a interview or I guess an informal or formal interview and I was like well you know I have my way of doing things and I do this and I do that and I 
tour and I have a certain way of thinking about the instrument. And um, I remember saying something like, I'm, I am not, I'm no Mick Goodrick, you know, but, um, and then Larry was like, uh, Thaddeus, you know, we have Mick Goodrick already, you know, <laughs> uh, we want somebody who does what you do. And I was like, really, you know, I thought this is what you do when you're out there in the world, you make records and you hustle and he, and, and I'll never forget this line, talk about those spirit. And he looked at me and he said, that is really think that you have a lot to offer the college. And I was like, really me yeah i thought i thought this was what you did i thought that you just you know this is how you make records this is how you make music this is how you record and so that pivotal moment so i guess the takeaway for me is that like everybody whether it's star faculty you know uh students whatever just realize like how much you take for granted that you already know it's just the way you do things you know it's the way you do things or it's the way you learn or it's way but but that has value regardless of whether or not and if whether you need a Larry Beyond to come and convince you that it's worth something or whatever just maybe try and believe that uh, trick yourself you know uh, do affirmations or mantras or whatever into believing that you know yeah I do have something of it because I don't know that I've met anyone in all my years of teaching who didn't have that certain je ne sais quoi that thing that if you just really nurtured it, it would just blossom into this beautiful, you know, expression, artistic, musical, whatever expression. So that's the takeaway is that everybody has something to offer, you know, and um, I don't know, that's, that's my little. Yeah, I think that is perfect advice for all of us. And thank goodness for all of us that we had Larry Payone. Oh my goodness. <laughs> because, you know, for all of us, he did that for me. He did that. I know that you've had that conversation with him, Cheryl. You've probably had that conversation with him too, Ian. And like, I always think that part of moving forward is to give that, you know, channel your inner Larry and yeah. remind people of their value. We need t-shirts with that on yeah. it. Channel I think we do. Your inner Larry. And Larry right now, if when he hears this, he's going to be like, oh, come on. <laughs> Like, what's well, the matter I remember, with you? <laughs> I remember, I remember, uh, I remember, like, remember those four th before Berkeley as a student, after as Berkeley as a student, before Berkeley as hired as faculty, after. Larry was in each of those befores and afters. And as a student, I still remember this, this one thing, you know. <laughs> I remember being in an improv class and Larry Bayon was a teacher, you know. And we're soloing, we're soloing. I'm doing my thing, I'm doing my ear thing. And like, and Larry stops, boom, Thaddeus what chord you're playing over. And I was like, oh, 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 uh, okay, I get it now. You know, it was like that pivotal moment. I was like, and he probably doesn't remember it, but I, I'll never forget it. It's like, so it's, yeah, I get it now, you know? And so Larry's been there at, at every single pivotal moment, you know, before Berkeley as a student, after Berkeley as a student, you know, before Berkeley as faculty, you know, he's been there in that in that little equation. So again, you know, those moments and just like, you know, valuing, you know, like valuing what somebody has to offer and, and knowing enough to steer them gently in the right direction, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like honoring that among all of us all the time, you know, just that reminder all the time. Yeah. To say, I've heard him say that so many times, like, we already have this person or we don't have this person on the faculty. We have you and we have mm -hmm. you for a reason or to say to a student, you know, we picked you, we believe in you. Now you can trust us and go do what you need to do. Right. And um, I think that's really cool. I think that says a lot about our department that we, oh, yeah. that not only that we heard that, but we remember it and we're conscious of it and, and everything we're doing. So Maybe there's hope for us, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an honor. I still, I am still blown away. It's still an honor to be a member of the team, uh, mm -hmm. the Berkeley fac guitar faculty, and some of the greatest minds, uh, you know, of guitar in the world. You know, just, you know, just being a part of that. I still pinch, I still pinch myself to this day. You know. Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Thaddeus. Thank you for being here with us. Um, Cheers to you, your coffee, and uh, coffee cheers. Ian, thank you so much, um, and Cheryl. Me.
And thank you, Thaddeus. And uh, we'll see you next time on the next. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. All right.